decision from those with, or you just do it. If that's I just, right. I just started it. So now you have to okay. talk seriously so, and eloquently. If, or you can just pause it. <laughs> <laughs> just mute. Um, if we've got slides, then we just go into screen sharing at the time. Correct. Yep, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll stop sharing uh, in a second. Um, this is just to, so people know they're in the right place. Yeah. And then people are arriving into the call now, I think. So, uh... Yep, I could see a bunch of people. Hello, everyone. Um, I know I, I, I made the mistake last time I putting up the gallery display. So um, <laughs> if I that, then we can, I can, that ended up on the recording. So it got a bit confusing. So I'm going to try not to do that too much. Um, but I can see a bunch of people now on the call. Um, some familiar faces. If I start calling them out, I feel like I'm in romper room. I can see, uh, I can see a Trish and I can see a Fiona. <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys won't, some of you may know that reference, some of you may not. Um, so anyway, uh, look, are we, what do you think? Another minute? Yeah, another minute. All right. One of the downsides of always setting my watch fast. Um, so I'm not late to meetings, but of course, you know, the, the walking time has decreased significantly. <laughs> I think actually, this is uh, like a learning such learning experience with um, just doing like a fully online working day that if you got to put in, um, if you have to do shorter meetings. Um, so, so all of my one hour meetings are now 50 minutes and my half hour meetings are 25 minutes just to get a little bit of a uh, of break. Otherwise, yep. you can do it back to back full day, you know. Well, to be fair, we used to, I used to do that at Nesta, but that was mainly because you had to sort of run to different parts of the building. Whereas, right. whereas here, yeah, you just need to go and get some fresh air and a glass of yeah, water. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so we might make a start if that's all, all right. Um, welcome back. Uh, everyone, welcome everyone to the third uh, session on how not to waste a, waste a crisis. Um, my name is Brenton Hacken. Um, uh, I've recognised some familiar faces uh, and names on the call, so obviously a few of you have come back. Um, welcome back. Those who are joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. Um, we're hoping that these uh, sessions will be a chance to um, dig into, a, I guess, a few different topics uh, around uh, this crazy moment that we're all experiencing together. Um, two weeks ago, Jeff kicked us off um, with uh, Marco and uh, Gabriella um, looking at the, the big picture. Last week, we talked, uh, we dug into the social contract uh, and how we're seeing that being uh, sort of challenged um, in this moment. And tonight, today, um, we want to sort of dig into the topic of leadership uh, and what does public innovation leadership look like at this moment. Um, we're really excited to have Andrea and Sam and Christian with us, um, who will be uh, saying a few, few words shortly. Uh, in the meantime, I have some public service announcements. Um, if you're joining the call, stay on mute for now. Um, there will be, um, I think James has already shared it in the chat, a Google Doc uh, where we'll be doing live notes. Um, so feel free to pull that up on the side. Um, and follow the commentaries there or add stuff in or add questions. Also use the chat to um, throw in questions and we'll sort of draw on those as we go through. Um, we will be recording, we are recording. Uh, we'll be sharing this and the Google Doc uh, at the, uh, after the call. Um, I think that's it. If you want to um, quickly uh, jump onto chat and say hello and where you're dialing in from, it's always nice to sort of see um, who we've got uh, on the call. So, um, what we're going to do now, um, and this, I, I might have to uh, tick back with Jesper here, um, because um, I think you control the uh, breakout rooms, Jesper, is we tried this last week and it seemed to work quite well. So we're going to do it again. Um, we're going to uh, have a quick moment to break out into smaller groups and just have a chance to meet some of the other people who are on the call. Um, we've given you a few prompts here, so you know, maybe introduce yourself um, how are you feeling at the moment? This is your chance to check in, bring your whole person into the conversation. Um, what's on your mind? And obviously, we're about to have this conversation uh, around leadership. So maybe what interests you about this topic or what questions sitting with you? Um, so I am going to leave that there. Jesper, 
Can you do the breakout rooms or shall I just try? I will try. Okay. Uh, we'll see you in five minutes time. Thanks, Jesper. Hey, Jesper. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I'm just a little late. That's okay. Uh, hang on one sec. Um, just signing people into rooms. Okay. See, create some, another one. You. Okay. Not letting me. Anyway, we can have a conversation here, the rest of us. Why not? <laughs> How are you doing? Where, where are you coming in from? Coming from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Well, yeah, of course. And you, you said you were based in Copenhagen, right? Yeah, I'm in, based in Copenhagen now. Um, uh, uh, in uh, my family yeah. born in Copenhagen. Okay, wow. That's impressive. <laughs> Very good Danish speaking. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I was in London for um, three, and a, three or four years and then came back last year. Um, so, um, but I realized we have uh, possibly other people Hearing what we're saying, please feel free to check in. Uh, I've only created 25 breakout rooms at this point. So people that are a little bit late or not wanting to check in, that's okay too. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hi, Trish. Hi, Trish. How are you doing? Really good. Yeah, it's 10.30 p.m. here in Adelaide, uh, South Australia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What's your... Um, What's your th initial thought with this topic in mind? Ah, that it's important and uh, that it's a bit of a mystery and uh, we need to uh, start leading it. Uh, so I'm intrigued. What about you? Um, well, I think it's probably, I mean, it's so interesting to see how culturally different the responses have been um, with, with uh, how, well, both the style of leadership, but also how it sort of exposes the, the, the sort of cultural values of the, of the governance logics within, within states. Um, so I think those two are very interconnected. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the moment, you're, I guess you are seeing the, the, the stronger social systems uh, sort of prevail, at least initially. Um, in terms of of getting getting a, a good recovery or somewhat good recovery in that sense, but um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested in, in kind of, and I think it's a unique opportunity to to really do this called cross cultural learning. I'd say, and yeah. leadership, I think, is a good place to start. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So. 
So while the people are arriving, I'm just going to close down the rooms again. We have 60 seconds and we'll get on with the session. For those arriving late to the call, people are just arriving back from their one-on-one -on -one check ins So if you're wondering why nobody's doing anything, um, that's the case. Hello, uh, Christina. Right. So, Brenzen, do we have you back? Or is he now stuck? In the yes. All right, I'm muted. There we go. I'm unmuted now. And I'm back. Good. Thank you. That's good. That worked reasonably well. I hope people got to meet a few uh, additional um, faces. Um, and to start to really sort of get into this topic, um, uh, I've now got you up on the screen. So um, hopefully in a second, I'm going to throw to Sam, uh, Hannah Rankin. Um, I'm going to go light on the introductions because hopefully you've seen everyone's bios uh, when you signed up. But Sam is the Executive Director of Public Sector Reform in the Victorian Government in Australia um, and has been working with us at States of Change quite closely over the last few years. Um, so Sam, how, how's the view from Melbourne? It is a little dark here, but otherwise, great, thank you. Amazing to see everybody here. I've never been on such a large Zoom call. I normally get to two pages with our division, but not three, it's great. Um, so do you want me to kick off now, Brendan? Yeah, far away, yep. Cool. Okay, I'm going to screen share and hopefully this will all work smoothly. So um, thankfully, uh, Brenton's given you a little bit of context already in the sense that um, I work in Melbourne, in Australia, in um, public sector reform in the state government and we're in the Department of Premier and Cabinet, which is a central agency. And we work across government um, to embed new behaviours and ways of working to deliver better outcomes for the public. Um, so we work, on, we work on policies and projects and we leverage the specialist capability that we have in our areas, um, like the behavioral insights work, our innovation work, we do a lot of work in outcomes and evidence um, to help uh, grow capability. So working very much in partnership with departments. Um, and we also run a network that brings nearly 15,000 public servants together to talk, uh, to, to learn, share and connect with each other, which is a really great distribution channel and then also a peer resource network um, for change. So the good bit, and the reason I'm doing this is because I think it's in it's context for what I'm going to talk about and how leadership looks from this perspective um, in this situation, because we're in a central agency, so we have fantastic visibility across government, and um, in particularly in terms of this crisis and in, in exactly what's working um, and what's happening. Um, but we don't actually own the policy delivery or the service delivery work. We work with the people who do. So that in a global pandemic kind of time, we're actually a little bit peripheral, um, even when we could be most useful because the people who are in the critical path of things um, are so busy and, and facing into such an overwhelming kind of requirement that they really don't have the time or space or even like basic cognitive capacity to engage with thinking about how you could do things a bit differently. So it creates some really unique um, challenges in terms of leadership and um, hopefully that um, resonates with some of the situations that people have here. Um, now, <laughs> I'm discovering that I don't know how to change when I'm sharing the screen with the next. Yes, okay, here we go. Okay, so, um, so in this context, um, 
we think of uh, leadership as being opportunistic and entrepreneurial and we always have like that's always been sort of part of the way that we do our work um, but it's a very different environment that we're working in now because we need to find out where we can be useful without being in the way so showing people what we could do or even asking is actually starting to interfere in people's critical path work so and a classic example is around behavioral insights and you know in the communication space around this pandemic behavioral change is clearly a critical component um, but uh, we and we were designing beautiful proposals around where we could work and the value proposition and how we could help. Um, but we just didn't understand how little capacity people had to even think about where we might fit because of the demands of their day to day work. And it really required us kind of begging and uh, wheedling our way into their daily stand ups just as pure observers to get a sense of what they were going through. Um, seeing an opening where we could be of assistance and doing, you know, at the end of the day, some work that that's, um, was relatively basic, but allowed us to provide them with this, you know, central repository of frequently asked questions that could be informed by behavioral insights so that we were actually of use in a way that didn't detract from what they were doing. Um, I'm sure all of this kind of stuff will stabilize in due course as the crisis becomes kind of business as usual, but it's been really fascinating in these starting stages of the pandemic response. Um, the big learning for me, and this has been a continuing challenge for me, is um, how the leadership in this context needs to be very humble and compassionate, um, particularly when we're not in a situation where we're given a clear leadership role in this work. Um, this is really the time where we can't afford to have ego or think that we know better or even be frustrated because we really want to get involved, but no one's letting us play on the swings at the moment. It's actually kind of about understanding how massively this pandemic is impacting us as humans trying to work in unfamiliar terrain. And from a behavioral perspective, people in that situation, they're in fight or flight. Um, you go to what you know, you go to what you can do, you go to the people that you know. Um, and that's natural to do as we navigate through. And so leadership in this space is then about being of service and understanding that that's where people are um, and trying to help um, and help them do what needs to happen. So finding the holes again, I guess. Um, and, you know, this is something that's come up, you know, particularly in the remote working kind of thing where effectively our entire public service in terms of departments have lifted up and gone into remote working. Um, our teams always work flex flexibly, so it hasn't been a big issue for us. Um, and so we were helping um, some of the department uh, work around trying to make that transition easier which made us realize that people needed a space to find out how other people were navigating this. That wasn't about like the HR policy or the IT policy or the procurement policy. It's just about as people, how can we make this work? And so we were able to set up a remote working hub on our innovation network platform that's actually turned out to be a really great resource and is starting to be used and brought a heap more people onto the platform and using it. Um, which means that it's been really useful as well, but it's an opportunity we would never have seen if we hadn't just been ha hanging around and helping out a bit. Um, and then the other, the other kind of aspect of the leadership that I think has been really interesting is the strategic and tactical side of it, um, which again, it's like you always need to be strategic and tactical, but um, what it's really, this situation has really forced us to think about our comparative advantage um, because we're not in the main game of the pandemic response. Um, it actually means that we do have a level of capacity and perspective that's not afforded to the people who are getting sucked into that work. And so we've been able to start thinking about our work quite clearly, um, understanding that we need a focused approach on two very different time horizons that need to run in parallel and inform each other, but are quite separate. So tactically, we have to proactively pursue and respond to crisis needs. You know, the police have an enforcement issue here. That's a great opportunity for us. Let's see how we can help them. Um, but, um, and that helps to build relationships and trust and understanding that will help inform our other work. But we also strategically need to think about how are we going to inform and deliver the future state, um, which is not necessarily just kind of thinking about green fields, but also understanding, trying to figure out where the value lies in the response work that's happening now, what's really worth continuing, what genuinely is working, what aspects of it and what evidence and data do we need to capture now so that we can feed that into the future state. And 
we need to start building those relationships and that trust now, not kind of thinking about it when we get there. And so really investing in that side of things as well. Which is kind of a nice segue to that question of what governments should be doing or what they could be learning or how they could be dealing with uncertainty and ambiguity. And I think we've got a really interesting situation in Victoria at the moment where, um, you know, I, uh, everywhere in this kind of context, we're trying to multitask, dealing with the response and dealing with the BAU and trying to juggle all the different balls that are happening at the moment. Um, and what uh, the behavioral side of things will tell you once again is that humans just can't multitask. And so in Victoria, we've learned, we've learned through uh, some of the bushfire emergency response work that when you have these emergency responses, they suck everything into their wake. And quite often that creates longer term challenges and instability for governments well beyond the actual emergency response. And so, you know, in Victoria last week, our Premier announced that we're actually um, basically not going to do multitasking. Government's going to focus and split and there'll be a redesign of ministerial and public service structures. Not will be, it's happening now. So this is not creating a task force. This is creating two complementary structures of government where one is focused on the response to the COVID-19 situation, short term and longer term, and the other one is dealing with um, the BAU work of government and keeping everything running, which needs to happen even in this kind of environment. So it's quite a genuinely innovative response to the situation. Um, I think just in terms of closing out, because my time is nearly up, um, the big thing to remember in all of this and what we can learn as leaders and government is that we're all human. And this, is, this crisis is like the perfect storm of uncertainty and ambiguity. It's immensely personal. Everybody is personally affected and trying to juggle it, as well as holding their professional responsibilities and public pressure. Um, so it's really a perfect storm for anyone working in the public sector. And in that context, creating space to listen and learn, which is always difficult and always important, is even more important and even more difficult. And especially for those of us who are sort of working to support the people who are working to support the front line, we need to be really kind about, um, there was a phrase that a panel member used in a previous session about having empathy for the system and creating the oxygen of generosity in a, in a difficult time. And I think that's um, that question of what we can learn and take into the future. We're all human. And if we can embed a little more of that humanity and compassion into our future states and our bureaucracies and our sectors, then I reckon we'll have got something of value from this entire process. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Sam. Um, I, I did see that news yesterday about the split in government. I hadn't really fully appreciated that you were effectively setting up twin tracks. So maybe we it's, might we might circle circle back to that in in the discussion, yeah. but it sounds fascinating. Um, and I imagine the number of people on this call would love to hear more about that as well. Um, but I'm going to keep us to time. So uh, we're now going to turn to Andrea. Uh, who is joining us from Cornwall, I suspect. Um, but Andrea uh, heads up the uh, Policy Lab in the UK, the Cabinet Office, um, who's going to share with us her perspectives. Um, Andrea, are you there? I am indeed. Um, and can I say up front, thank you to Brenton, Jesper and the team for putting this on. I think it's a fantastic uh, gathering. So it's been really great to be part of it. I really enjoyed the last sessions as well. Um, so I thought I'd probably come at this in a somewhat informal way. Um, I'm a civil servant, I work in the cabinet office, so you can imagine at the moment my policy lab team and my open innovation team very focused on COVID at the moment. Um, but in a sense I wanted to kind of step back and think more generally about how we think about leadership both before, uh, during and then after uh, the pandemic and, and what comes from that. And so it's probably worth saying also up front that as a civil service, this is not a political point and I I'm, can't make political points. Um, but um, I am here in Cornwall, um, which is uh, very peripheral to uh, my usual week in Westminster, which is, is one of the, I guess, core points in all of this is about the kind of distribution of power and how that has changed over the last few weeks uh, and months in some countries. And so um, I find myself, living on the edge, if you like, of, of the UK at the moment and having a very different perspective from that. So um, in, in my 10 minutes, I want to talk about what I think of as the three T's of leadership. 
Um, and needless to say, you know, we all know that every airport, every bookstore is just jam packed full of leadership advice and books on good leadership. And, you know, that's probably the single biggest topic in any kind of business management. So uh, there is a lot of data and research and evidence out there. Um, and I'm not going to really speak to that so much as just give you more of a personal perspective. So for me, the three T's of leadership are really about team, they're about timing, and they're about trust. And these are things that I think come up time and time again in the work that we do in the policy lab. And I think they probably endure in different con contexts. Um, you know, uh, we're obviously in a context right now which is much more about crisis management, and that requires a different form of leadership. But also then, as Sam was saying, when we look to what comes after in the future, and different forms of leadership that are needed as well. So, you know, when I think back over a lot time ago, really, like 30 years almost, um, I, was, I actually trained uh, to join the army. And um, I used to drive uh, tanks and fire machine guns. It was very exciting. And uh, one of the things I learned a lot about when I was training uh, to join the army was command and control. And although I didn't end up going into the army, um, one of the things I discovered through army training that's lived with me was this sense of team. And, you know, we would run assault courses. And if you only uh, were successful when your last member of your team crossed the line uh, was really important. But also the idea really that in any kind of command control situation, any kind of crisis situation, you cannot uh, make yourself indispensable so the idea of the hero leader the single leader is probably one that may be associated often with those kind of situations but actually the army would teach you the military would teach you you have to have second in command and you have to have collective leadership in a team and it's, it's very real because obviously in a military setting you might uh, you might die um i mean i was unwell about two weeks ago uh, i think it was probably covid and I was so pleased that my team were able to continue without me. And for a long time, I used to have Tom Peters quote on my wall. And he used to uh, have a quote that said, pretend you're leaving your job in six months with no replacement. And in a way, that sort of sense of the temporary, but also that you have to have the team, I think is really a quite an important lesson right now. The other thing I think, um, in leadership, uh, which I learned in the army, um, is about simplification and really thinking about when there's a lot of noise going on in the background, uh, whether we're good at multitasking or not, um, how do you distill down your ideas and communicate with great clarity? Um, Raymond Lowy famously said, the most beautiful curve in the world is an upward sales curve. And in many ways, we've all become very adjusted to the shape of different curves right now. And I think we know that innovation as a curve tends to kind of go up and then down before it then re-emerges. You kind of lose certainty in the dip. Um, and so when we think about how we operate, um, it's almost like we're operating sitting at the bottom of a swing pool. And when we try and communicate through these webinar setups, um, a lot gets lost. So there's something in my mind, certainly, that's really important in leadership at the moment around how can you create that? How can you distill, create that sense of clarity? And the art of communication, particularly visual communication, in our policy lab, we've been running futures workshops. Uh, last Friday, we ran one across government. And uh, it was actually really amazing to use the, the art of visual communication in that session. We put all our evidence into uh, Trello, for example. Uh, so the first one I think is about team uh, and sharing that uh, across the team. Um, the second point I would make on leadership, I think, uh, again, drawing on all the work we've done in the policy lab over six years, is the importance of timing. I think we tend to think that timing is, that the future is some kind of linear progression from the present, uh, when in fact we walk backwards often into the future. And this idea that, that it's quite incremental has also, I think, been challenged through this COVID um, crisis. And in terms of timing, you know, I think Lenin once said, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And I think we all are feeling that a lot is happening. Uh, and a lot of things that were unimaginable 
And, and in the lab, I reflect that we often talk about working in the space between the rules. Um, and of course, in this kind of context, a lot of those rules have radically shifted, which has created a lot more space. And, and with that comes anxiety. And I think innovation teams can handhold because we're quite familiar with working with that level of ambiguity. Um, you know, the, we always think, if you like, that you open the front door and the world outside will look exactly the same as it used to. And so in a way, our mental models are, are, are going to be quite important, I think, at this time in thinking about how we think of the world. I, I don't know about anyone else, but when I uh, do like live calls, I still imagine people are in their offices. I, I somehow have got this deluded sense that I'm the only one who is in lockdown and everyone else is, is still in the office. And I picture them in their, in their offices. There's like the mental model is so powerful of work for me that I, I still struggle to really connect with the idea that no one is actually in the office at the moment. Um, so we've kind of shifted back to an agrarian state where we used to live above the sheep. And, um, you know, our home has become the office. And that, that decentralization of power out to communities, out to people living in their homes rather than center centers of workforce um, has been a powerful and important shift in power, which may, may change afterwards. Um, power has also shifted incidentally the other way towards big government and government taking a much more command control uh, move. And, and I think the, the final point I wanted to make was about this idea of trust uh, at times like this and the importance of trust in leadership. And I think there's a trust, if you like, has a bit of a half life. It, it needs restoring through social connectivity and it needs rebuilding. And so as the weeks go on to months, um, our reservoirs of trust might decrease, but we're also creating new ones. And uh, I think Stephen Covey uh, once said that change moves at the speed of trust. Um, I, I prefer the idea really that trust is the currency of community and really thinking about how um, our communities are rising to this challenge. There's a huge opportunity there for sure. Um, Trust is also obviously at a kind of a, a whole society level as well when we think about the trust economy. So it might well be that one of the positives that comes from this change will be an emergence, if you like, a, a volunteering revolution, a, a renaissance, if you like, of the kinds of trust that we will need uh, in the future. And we may end up with a much greater abundance of social capital. Uh, I know in the UK, at one stage, it was about 16% of people knew their neighbours, uh, whereas in Australia and other countries, uh, Tasmania, I think, has a massively high level of um, positive social neighbourliness. So um, I think those three, when taken together, are really important when we think about leadership. Uh, the idea of the team, uh, the idea of timing, getting the timing right and really thinking about when is the moment that change will happen and, and what will stick and what won't. And then finally, this idea of trust. Um, I have incidentally been sort of thinking about this a little bit more in terms of COVID context and uh, I've written a blog on this, which I think we're going to publish uh, maybe later today or later in this week. So uh, just also flag that. And I'll finish with a, with a quote by Dennis uh, Waitley, who uh, another kind of one of these business uh, management experts, I guess, um, who said, expect the best, plan for the worst, but prepare to be surprised. And I think as innovation teams, we're in the business of really helping people understand and think about the future and what might be the unthinkable and the surprise. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I think they're already starting to see some kind of linkages between um, uh, Sam's points and, and, and some of the things that you just said around. Uh, I think as, as people working in the innovation space, we do tend to spend a lot of our time navigating ambiguity uh, and recognizing that our assumptions are, are there to be challenged, but that's not, that's not sort of everyone's experience and everyone's reality, but it is actually right now. And so the question is, what is, what is our role to support people um, who may be navigating ambiguity and uncertainty at levels that they haven't done before? Um, and, you know, in a humble and, uh, and a collaborative, uh, compassionate way, as, as Sam mentioned. Um, great. Uh, our third uh, contribution is from Christian, who's joining us from, uh, well, I'm assuming he's, assuming he's joining us from Copenhagen. Uh, Christian is uh, Chief Executive of the Danish Design Centre. Uh, Christian, uh, why don't you tell us how you're doing and your thoughts on the topic? Over to you. 
Thanks, Prince, and a pleasure being with uh, with everyone and uh, and sharing uh, stories. I'm I'm learning a lot uh, as as uh, this session unfolds. Um, so I'm doing well, uh, considering, as they say. Um, and I wanted to share a few thoughts with you on on leadership. And um, on the one hand, um, I, I just realized as Andrea was speaking that uh, at least a handful of the, of, of my books uh, over the past years have been uh, have had the title lead, "Leading" or "Leadership" in its title. So so I've of course spent some time on the topic, but uh, even though you can fill. Uh, airport bookstores with literature on leadership, it's still, to me, sometimes a bit mysterious what, what actually is good leadership. And of course, the context we're in right now um, certainly puts uh, some of the some uh, of leadership practices on its, on its edge, so to speak. Um, so this is also, I think, from, you know, for me, a, an interesting opportunity to kind of reflect on, on, on what's, um, what needs, how we need to lead, really. Um, and I'll start with saying that uh, you know, as we all run organizations that are focusing on the future and innovation, I mean, our current uh, motto at the Danish Design Center is uh, um, empowering a business and, uh, and people and society to shape the next. And I don't think we assumed when we, when we coined that term that the next would be shaped more than, than by us, uh, but by, by a, a pandemic. Um, but of course, the question becomes, what, what is the next where we are now? And it reminds me of something I actually did put in one of my books, uh, 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 a, um, a concept developed by uh, William Bridges, who wrote a book called Transitions. And I think Transitions is a, is a nice uh, sort of just re re framing of, of what we are fo facing right now. And, 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 um, and Bridges, uh, uh, his name is William Bridges, he wrote about something called the neutral zone. And the neutral zone is what comes between endings and new beginnings. And in many ways, we are right now in the neutral zone and we need to somehow uh, lead in that, uh, what is essentially a vacuum. And interestingly, Bridges, he actually uh, uh, articulates in the neutral zone as where you go, where you are alone, uh, where you go out in the forest or you go uh, you know, away from the community. And in a way we are all alone right now, uh, even though of course we're trying to be together digitally and so on. Uh, so, so there's something to be said about this, uh, this space. Um, so that's one, one uh, I think, uh, starting point I'll, I'll, I'll return to. The other one is that um, how can we look at leadership uh, and leadership as a design challenge? Uh, and I'll try to reflect a little bit on that. Um, uh, because of course, we've, you know, we've always said that design, design leadership is to deal with complexity, uh, uncertainty, ambiguity, uh, turbulence, and so on. And so right now, in a sense, you can say, well, this is just kind of a heightened situation, a sharpened situation, but it's still the kind of situation we've always talked about uh, is where uh, design uh, methodologies, design thinking, uh, and, and leading design is relevant. So let me start by, by, this, uh, by the question of an attitude. Um, and again, this is not me coining it, but I think the notion of a, taking a design attitude to, uh, to, to the space we're in right now and to the crisis is, is important. And it's something we are definitely trying to do at the Danish Design Center and also encouraging our partners to do. And by design attitude, I'd like to quote uh, Richard Boland, one of the authors of the book Managing as Designing, who said um, that a design attitude is to view each project as an opportunity for invention um, that leaves the world in a better place than we found it. And that can maybe be hard to think about right now, but I do believe that as leaders, our ambition needs to be to take this uh, crisis uh, and, and not wasting it uh, as, as, as you framed the session, but actually try to seize the opportunity to leave the world in a better place. And I do think we are seeing some opportunities uh, here. Um, from, a, from a question of, of, of leading people, I think it's a question of, of motivation that I'm finding that in order to motivate our team, there's a, there's a narrative and a clarity around seeing this as ter terrible as it is, as an opportunity to do something good uh, and, and certainly do something uh, also different. And just as examples, also from the public sector space, I don't know if you remember it, but after the financial crisis, there was an opportunity to establish an entirely new agency in the United States called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, which became a, a bit of an icon of sort of digital uh, design and 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 really uh, you know one of the first new agencies in a very long time in the U.S. 
And that's a, one example of, of, of what can come out of a crisis and, and this kind of renewal, building something even from a blank slate almost. Uh, or another example is that our uh, Scandinavian airline system, SAS here in Denmark, after the 9-11 uh, crisis, uh, the leader there saw an opportunity to transform the company and make it uh, digital. I mean, in 2001, you couldn't even do a digital booking with Scandinavian Airlines. And of course, uh, I mean, if, 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 if they hadn't changed that, they would probably be out of business anyway. So just to say that there are some, so, some silver linings here. The second point I wanted to make is, is uh, something you already said, uh, Brenton, but probably we are we're sometimes challenging, challenging uh, each other is uh, the question of challenging your assumptions and also as a leader, inviting your team to do so. Uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of assumptions needing to be challenged around citizen behavior and around also customer behavior. Uh, in some of our programs, we work very directly with small and medium-sized companies, and many of them are right now struggling to discover ways in which they can be relevant to customers that are behaving radically different than what they did a month ago. Um, and many of them will need to just basically change their business model. Another thing to think, of course, uh, 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 to challenge is how digital can we be? Three weeks ago, I thought that we would lose quite a number of our projects and, and work because of, of the crisis. And we found out we didn't lose a single project because we were able to uh, pivot to digital very, very quickly. And that goes to Andrea's point about team, to having, having a team that very rapidly can, can, can shift uh, mode. And also, of course, having, having, uh, some, some, having the competencies needed to do so. I hear a lot of public servants right now say that they've been achieving in, in, in three weeks what they would think would take three, three years to do right. And it doesn't go specifically also for the healthcare system. So this is all about asking what if, and uh, as, a, as a leader uh, inviting in that kind of question, it's about abductive thinking to imagine uh, possible futures. Um, and uh, for us uh, in the Danish Science Center, not only sort of shifting to digital delivery, but also right now, we're actually starting an entire strategy process to, to really uh, prioritize um, uh, well, new ways of working, but also becoming, uh, becoming uh, as we call it, 100% digital. Third point I wanted to make is on uh, another one thing you said, <laughs> Brenson, which is navigating ambiguity, right? Um, and I've, I've said this in one of my books that it's almost like, you know, leading design is taking like taking a winding path through a, a dense forest where you can't really see where you're heading. You can't see the objective. You can't see what's at the end of the path. You're also not so sure what the means are to get there, which means that you have two uh, unknowns at the same time, your objective, uh, at least your precise objective, and also ways of getting there, which means that you have to allow for a certain loss of control. So for all for, I mean, I recognize the idea of commanding and controlling in the army, but I also believe that right now what we're seeing in this neutral zone is uh, uh, that we have to accept and come to terms with loss of control um, and, um, and allowing for discovery in this phase, in this process. And interestingly enough, uh, William Bridges says in, in his book, uh, Transitions, that this is also an opportunity to find out what you really want. And I'm seeing that in organizations, also my own, we are really finding out what, what is our purpose and, and, and uh, what do we want uh, also uh, way beyond the crisis. The fourth point and uh, almost last point I wanna make is to lead the learning process. Uh, because in this uh, uh, transition, uh, we, we do need to learn very rapidly. And that also need, means we need to come to terms with failure. Uh, but rather than to say we need to lead the failure, I think we need to lead the learning. The article I shared with everyone on in the document for today uh, is, a, is a piece I wrote recently uh, showing uh, how uh, the Danish Prime Minister, Meta Frederiksen, and interestingly, a lot of other uh, female leaders apparently have also shown, shown great courage and, and, and really true leadership in this crisis. But how she said at one of her very first press briefings to the public about the crisis that, you know, she said, we are going to fail. And then she paused for a moment and said, I am going to fail. And that is not a usual thing you hear from a, a state a leader. And, uh, and certainly I can, I can think of uh, other uh, leaders right now, maybe across uh, the pond to the west of here, who are not standing up to uh, embracing their own uh, uh, failure. That creates trust. It creates a, a trust to say, I don't know if this will work, but we do have to act. And in the article, I also compare that to um, to uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, story from, from the 1930s in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a similar crisis in the US or a big crisis in the US during the, the 30s, 
where he also said, I mean, basically uh, my, my platform as I go for the presidential election is to experiment. Uh, because if something, uh, you know, we don't know what will work, we have to try something. If it fails, we'll try something else. And he, he, he not only got elected, he was the longest sitting president in American history. So what that means for leaders is to involve the organization in examining um, what we learn, uh, looking closely at the data, uh, being ready to experiment. In my own organization, we've taken a pocket of money and are running 10 sort of tailored uh, experiments with small, bu small business to find out what works in terms of business support. And, and we've sort of put our anthropologists on that one to learn what, what works, what doesn't. And we are ready to acknowledge that we may be, be failing with spending the money on those. Uh, but then we can then target our next program uh, to, to hopefully get things more right. I'll end by by just uh, saying that, that fortunately, uh, uh, the book Transitions also has a, a chapter on new beginnings. And, um, and here I think there's, a, there's a, a valuable lesson, which is that, that at one point, uh, we have to stop getting ready and act. And right now I'm seeing organizations that are talking a lot and, and sort of preparing for something, but they maybe are not acting. And I think actually that, that, that very soon we all will have to start acting. Um, and uh, for our case, for instance, the acting we are doing is that we are working very, very hard to demonstrate in practice that a society's design resource or design resources, that is an investment in, 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 in transformation capability. That means that we are not only taking a quite technical approach, but we're also taking a very strategic approach saying long term, we must invest in our capabilities for innovation and change. And uh, one way of doing that is investing in the creative uh, skills and the competencies of designers. Um, and, uh, and we're certainly acting on that one. So with that, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for listening and look forward to the conversation. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Christian. Um, I'm just going to pause here for a second uh, to remind people that now is the time to jump on the chat uh, room and throw in questions, comments, challenges, uh, additions, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, between myself and Jesper and James and everyone, we'll keep an eye on the chat and we'll try and feed some of those questions in. Um, uh, Jesper also reminds me that this, uh, Christian, your last point is a perfect setup for our call next week, which is all about um, experimentation um, and learning. Uh, are we making the right failures at the moment? But I'll come back to that uh, at You're the welcome. end. Um, in, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the, the, the chat, but I guess one thing I just wanted to, to throw into the mix is it's more of a, um, an additional point and an observation for, for anyone to respond to uh, as much as a question, but um, just a little bit more on the Australian context. We, um, you know, we had um, a, 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 a rescue package passed through federal parliament last week, $200 billion, uh, $130 billion wage subsidy for the next six months for 40% of the workforce uh, by a conservative government. Um, and interested, the federal treasurer was on, um, was on uh, television on the weekend, uh, and he actually um, uh, uh, basically gave us an insight to a conversation he'd had with the former Prime Minister, John Howard. And he basically said, uh, apparently John Howard said to, to the current uh, Prime Minister and Treasurer, at times like this, there are no ideological constraints to action. So basically, you, you know, at this moment, don't be constrained by what our party manifesto is or by what we've said in the past. These are situations that are, you know, outside of the usual situation, a bit like FDR in the 30s. Um, and those, these constraints no longer hold. Now, I guess what I'm quite interested in, um, there's a couple of things in that. I mean, one, one thing I've learned from spending a little bit of time around design is we talk about design, about optimising within constraints. <laughs> what happens when some of those constraints turn out to be illusory, whether that's temporary or permanent, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but um, what can we learn about our ability to, um, to um, test going forward what are genuine constraints um, or what are just sort of mental prisons that we've created for ourselves and, and how do we learn from this moment going forward? So as I say, that was a bit of a word cloud of a, of, of a, of a thought rather than a question, but I don't know if that, any, if that prompted any thoughts in, um, uh, in any of uh, Andrea, Sam, Christian, we'd like to pick up that and I'll have a look at the chats. Christian. Yeah, so um, 
as I'd also just put in the chat, I, I think, you know, thanks for the question, Brenton. I think that in some ways we're seeing some quite extreme versions of, of sort of taking a political stance to the crisis. So for instance, in, uh, in Denmark, I mean, uh, again, with all due respect to our prime minister's uh, handling, there's also been a sense that as a social democrat and coming from a center, center left perspective, this is like, uh, she's really thriving in a sort of a big government state uh, uh, centralized uh, approach. And you also see a heavy focus on, on welfare, on, on, on the vulnerable, vulnerable citizens, on, on healthcare and public services, and not on, on as much on business, as much on innovation across society, as much on creativity, startups, uh, novel solutions, technology, and what that can bring to the table. So I, th so I think that, that's, in, that's sort of, in, in a way, you're getting extreme versions of, of political uh, ideologies. On the other hand, you have a country like Sweden that we've been observing very closely as a, as a close neighbor, where you have the bureaucracy uh, in very much leading the charge, and not without criticism, but taking sort of an evidence-based and, 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 and very sort of rational approach to, to things, which has led to different policy outcomes. So I think there's an interesting dilemma there. And when we talk about leadership in, in the context of, of government and, and across labs and, and other actors, and there's a question of you know ideology versus uh, evidence really i think there's a tension that's interesting to explore and also we'll see what works best in getting us out of the crisis Very good um I've, I've had a chance to have a quick look at the chat and a lot of people want to hear a little bit more about victoria sam and this um i think i think christian's come up with the, the title for his next book ambidextrous government <laughs> and I brain, right brain. <laughs> there was a, question. Us a little bit more yes yeah, um there was a question in there i think about telling us how it's going to work and I think what's, what's amazing, it kind of draws on a couple of different things that have come out. Um, one is the aspect of dog years that we, we're living in at the moment, in the sense that every day is like a week packed into a day kind of thing. Um, so this came out last week. And um, it, it's... Um, and it's, it's a very, it's quite a fundamental split and it's very emergent. And so it, it's fascinating watching this happen and it's extraordinary. Like uh, we're an innovation team, so we should be like totally appreciative of Emergent. Mm. And we're like, where are the details? We wanna know how this is gonna work. We want that, you know, that security and understanding. And it's being worked through in, in, in as everything's happening. So um, there is definitely a sense that it's all the secretaries of the departments who are leading the missions, which are part of the response work and they cover all aspects. So we're really focusing on the, on the people and community and the health and also the economic aspect of it. So it's quite nicely balanced. There's also a focus within those missions around um, the response, but also the recovery restoration. So people have slightly different angles and timeframes. And then there's sort of a centralized program of work that the secretary's handling himself around um, the more um, cross, uh, cross everything kind of issues around where are the critical risks and opportunities as a whole of the system as a whole and what kind of behavior change in communities are we moving to. Um, but it is definitely something where all the secretaries are pulled into the response work. Um, the, their associate secretaries who are moving into the, t uh, running the departments. Um, those arrangements are being negotiated between people to make it work. And, um, and it's really fascinating to see how everyone's just kind of, we're feeling our way into it a bit. Yeah, I'm, I, I was just um, mindful, you mentioned behavioral insights at the, in, in earlier and, um, and you know, Daniel Kahneman talked about sort of system one and system two, you know, and, and, and system one is the kind of the instinctive, like that's the fight or flight and the system two is the slightly more sort of rational, calculating, longer term, weighing up the pros and cons. Yeah, and it's, it's really interesting because actually he actually talks about the switching costs between putting the, the two of them yeah. and actually what you're doing is you're you're actually setting up an institutional form. Um, I mean, one thing I would say we mentioned a couple of weeks ago is this, this um, a, a blog post about putting innovation and learning teams alongside response teams. It'd be really interesting to see whether there's an opportunity to capture to, to ride shotgun through this process and try and capture some of these learnings, because I suspect um, many people on this call, I suspect many people in governments around the world would be really interested in actually understanding whether you know, that kind of separation of hemispheres, as it were, I think with the thinking thing, actually how that works um, yeah. and, and what, what are the pros and cons and, and how you execute that. So, 
Yeah, and you'd be you'd be surprised and amazed to know that we are working on exactly that process at the moment, trying to figure out how we can how we can insinuate in there in a way that's not threatening or intrusive or impeding in any way the need for really quick decision making, but trying to introduce some stream around evaluation and learning that can be actually integrated into that work in the missions and also in the in the core decision making bodies and the governance structures, because I think that's that's where the future state opportunities are, is really shifting the way that bureaucracies and, and ministers, because it's, it's really negotiating those relationships in a much more pragmatic way as well. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm going to try and paraphrase a, a question that's come up in the chat um, and, and sort of throw this open to the group. But um, one thing that we maybe haven't really sort of explicitly talked about is this notion of sort of distributed leadership. Um, you know, the fact is, this isn't just about one, you know, one leader sitting on top of a system making all the right calls, but actually a lot of this is about coordination across agencies, a lot of this is coordination across different levels of government, and, and you know, increasingly we'll be seeing coordination across governments internationally. Um, you know, in, in Australia, um, for, for those who, from other countries, um, we've, we've had a, um, a, another sort of experiment going on whereby a, a, a sort of forum uh, of governments between state and federal um, that meet normally twice a year have been meeting twice a week. Um, and this week they sort of said, actually, we want this process to keep going indefinitely. So we're seeing some really interesting um, roles of um, rather than seeing sort of the relationship between different tiers of government in a, in a combative role, actually it's, it's, it's genuine collaboration because it has to be. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if, um, if, if that experience has been um, replicated in other countries, uh, Christian, Andrea, um, or Sam, I don't know if you've got any reflections on what it's like to be at the sub-national level dealing with the feds at the moment, uh, or what you've picked up on the grapevine, but um, I'll throw that open to anyone who wants to talk a little bit about distributed leadership. Andrea. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, I mean, it has been quite interesting in the UK context that um, Brexit required a lot more um, joined up work across departments uh, for actually relatively similar reasons in that the shift in the rules and the, and the new spaces and opportunities when you take away rules uh, demands new configurations and therefore you end up with these different uh, conversations. So actually over the last few years, uh, UK government has been doing a huge amount of joined up work and in fact set up a systems unit in order to help us do that and it isn't i don't think coincidental that that systems unit are now being um, deployed on covid thinking about what renewal looks like after covid because of the nature as you say of this system's um, complexity and the need to work across a local central and international contexts on challenges like this and of course climate change is yet another one uh, that would fall within this category. So in the lab, we, we created the government as a system uh, toolkit to enable that. And although we're just on version one, the version two that's coming will be really about engaging citizens in that as well. So for me, the distributed leadership, of course, has to be across the actors that have power in, this, in the government contexts. But I think the future of that will be also then enabling citizens and distributing that power beyond the walls of our traditional institutions. Excellent. Um, yeah, so that, that was going to be my next one about how do we, how do we bring communities into this sort of um, conversation? So there's not just, we, we tend to default to talking about sort of institutions and formal structures, but actually how do we distribute decision making into place, into community? and sort of reverse the polarity sometimes of actually sort of uh, articulating what's actually needed and, and I guess sort of creating sort of that servant leadership from, from government. Um, and um, we had um, a comment, uh, in fact, not on this call, but um, and, um, on a separate call about one of the big challenges for governments that we're seeing um, is that governments aren't used to um, handling so many uh, voluntary offers of help and so this, you know, this sort of um, coordination gap on like, you suddenly like you've got manufacturers who are stepping up to sort of offer their services or you've got volu you know, volunteers popping up all over the place and government isn't used to having people come and just, you know, offer things for free and the systems of government and procurement just don't know how to process this. 
So actually, how do we kind of create a different kind of orchestration and convening role as much as the decision making role? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of both time. Um, yes, okay. Uh, and, and yes, was giving me the wind up. Um, so um, we did this last week and it also seemed to work. Um, so um, we're going to do, do it again, um, which is we're going to wrap uh, here at the first hour in the next minute or two after a few um, public service announcements. And then if people would like to hang on the call, we're going to have a further 30 minutes chat, which can be a little bit more discursive and free form. Um, we've, I think uh, Sam can stay. I th Andrea, I can't, I don't know if you can stay. I know Christian has to go. Um, so I won't put you on the spot. You can just think about that one. Um, I have a little mean, bit more time, um, so I'll, I'll hang a little bit. You've got a bit more time? Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, so if I just do that. Um, so basically, uh, this is if you're going to stay, we've got an extra half an hour for extra discussion. If you're leaving now, um, we'll see you next week. This is a chance for me to do a quick advert advertisement for next week's speakers. Um, so we're looking at experimentation in time of crisis. Are we making the right mistakes? Um, and we um, will be talking with Hafen uh, from the Singapore government, who I think is on the call with us tonight. Um, Miko uh, Anala from uh, Demos Helsinki, as well as Giulio Poggiotto from the UNDP, who I think is also lurking on this call. Um, so um, those of you who are joining us from Australia and New Zealand, uh, you'll be pleased to know that this is a slightly earlier time, 8 a.m. Central European summertime, which makes it about 4 p.m. in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, so um, if you'd like to join us then, um, please do so. Um, feel free to um, continue the conversation with us on Twitter. Um, as I said, we'll be sending out the recordings and the Google Docs uh, soon. And uh, again, a bit of a teaser that we are trying to pull together and there'll be more communication around a virtual learning festival So um, with that, I'm going to pause and let people jump off the call. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. And if you'd like to have a longer chat with us, sit tight for 30 seconds. Excellent. So um, we have about 35 people still on the call. So um, that's good. So about half of us want to keep going. Um, so um, Jesper, you've been very quiet. Have you got some thoughts you'd like to throw into the mix? Put you on the spot. Yeah, you're putting me on the spot. Thank you, Brenton. <laughs> I was just going through uh, the, the questions uh, that both came up in the chat as well as before the the session and i think there's plenty of good stuff in here so so why don't we kind of look at that um and particularly um so one of our fellows marco actually flagged before this call um that this would also be um challenging how we define or measure good performance um i think if this is especially important um when it comes to what we learn about what we focus on um and we're talking about how this potentially influences uh, not just the, let's say, the operating models, but also, I guess, the cultures and the sort of uh, the management focus, if you will. Um, so I wonder if the panelists might have any thoughts on, on that on that theme. Yes, but I would love to say something intelligent, but I missed the first half of that question and it sounded really interesting. Can you repeat that? <laughs> um, well, uh, so Marco raised uh, this question around how this will potentially be influencing the standard by which we measure good performance. Yeah, yeah. But actually, it will shift the focus of what good looks like, uh, whether it's on a kind of day-to-day -day basis, the models that we build, uh, as well as kind of the cultures that we, that we kind of Foster. Um, so, so would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, because I think that's the that's the really exciting opportunity is that the, particularly in terms of the culture and the and someone in one of the questions kind of raised the the fact that we can in a bureaucracy still make very quick 
quick decisions and quite like massively fundamental shifts. Um, so I think that's the opportunity of trying to capture how that's working, why that's working and what evidence and data we have to try and perpetuate that as the new normal into the new future state, as opposed to reverting back out of crisis into complacency. That's the, that's the stuff that gets me quite excited. I have to yeah, so actually, Sorry, Christian, go on. No, I like to sort of add to that. I mean, the, um, Martin Stewart Weeks uh, wrote this piece on the innovation dividend, right? And I think, um, I mean, we are seeing in incredible agility and speed uh, happening. Uh, and, and you kind of wonder whether, as when the dust settles, whether people won't say, you know, we, we, we could do that. Why aren't we still doing it? I, I think we'll see a government that's much better at working digitally, uh, that's much better working in a distributed way that is uh, probably more disciplined with its time. I mean, one of the things that I've always struggled with working in central government has been how people never value their time. And, and you'll have meetings with 12 people where, you know, only three of them actually needed to be there. Um, and that happens in all bureaucracies, also in the private sector. But still, I think you'll, we're right now putting a, a very big premium on, on time and, and, and that I don't think that will go away necessarily. I think... Um, I think for I think it'll be very very I mean of course some of what's happening right now and you mentioned that yourself Sam is and we see the same in Denmark that some of the people at the really heart of the storm they've been working 24 7 you know for for weeks and weeks and weeks and there's not been any time or, or space for taking in those who are a little bit more peripheral to the processes in terms of bringing in methodologies and tools and so on um, so what would be interesting would actually be to study what, did, what were they doing for those two or three weeks when they worked 24 seven? Um, and uh, uh, were they working in, a, in, a, in, a, in smart ways, in, in effective ways, or were they actually just working a lot? And it's probably a mix. I think to some extent, maybe, you know, not everybody's been working in, in a particularly agile way, but they've just been working all the time. Yeah, and, and it's really interesting because we've got, because we're so versed in bushfires and so on, we've got very good protocols and learning protocols around emergency management, but because they're not often seen at an emergency level in the policy development area and at the kind of, they're not necessarily getting used um, because we're drawing in so many people who aren't conversant in emergency. So it's, it's, it's Absolutely. fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, of course you can say some of the people right now, I mean, for example, our uh, permanent secretary, the, the one we, we, we refer uh, mostly to, he was also there uh, for 9-11 uh, and he was also there for, um, for the financial crisis. And that means that this experience of, of acting extremely fast, also working with parliament on that has been there. And I actually think there's a, a conversation that I think is really interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm preparing to write something on this one, but basically those governments, you just look at Finland, uh, uh, by the way, where Marco is coming from, where they have experience and they remember the experience. Uh, and, and that goes for you as well, probably in, in, in Victoria on, on the bushfire experience that they seem to have been much better at coping. Uh, we saw the same with the financial crisis. Those countries like Sweden back then, which had, had, had experienced similar crisis within a decade, were much, much better equipped to deal with this. So the question for me is, let's imagine that we don't have the luxury of having nasty experiences in the past. How can we still prepare leaders and organizations to respond to, to futures as if they had the experience? And that's where I believe that sort of immersive design methodologies and working with foresight, you know, design and foresight, design scenarios, as we call it, might be a way forward because here you, 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 you create immersive experiences and empathy with situations that have not happened yet, but you rehearse them and you actually work with them and on them and what would happen and how would you react. And so when and if the crisis does happen, you've actually tried it before. You've tried it in a simulation. You've tried an experiment. You've tried a prototype, but nonetheless, you, you may be better equipped than Otherwise, I'm going, to, I'm going to check in with Marco to see if he's he's actually on the call. I see. So whether he's 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 okay with those responses. I like to hear about the stockpiles of uh, protective gear you've had since the Second World War, Marco. Um, yes. Hi guys. Um, a, a, a quick comment on the stockpiles. Actually, we we had this when we were talking with Jeff and um, uh, I think in the first call. It turned out that a lot of the stuff in the stockpiles had expired by the time we opened it. I can imagine. <laughs> um, and, um, and so I, I think what we're beginning to recognize, and I think we're seeing this across the world, is that we need to begin to bring some of those capabilities closer to home 
um, to be self-reliant and strategic assets. So it's not so much hoarding the equipment, but having, for example, the manufacturing equipment to quickly yeah. begin to produce different kinds of uh, yeah. issues. I mean, I, you know, people talk about Finland uh, and say the work, war experience we had or Finland uh, in 1990, our economy, GDP collapsed by 14%. We had 20% unemployment and we had a banking crisis. So when the banking crisis came in 2008, we were better prepared for that. And I think there was a kind of uh, an experience of a collective effort, not unlike the COVID experience yeah. that we're doing right now. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I would draw a bit of a distinction between saying nations have had, you know, sort of his, uh, history or a narrative or a series of collective experiences that allow them to come together very quickly. Versus, and this is, I keep coming back to this, is how we're going to respond to the second wave of COVID. And, yeah, and, the awesome. yeah, and so now we have three, four, five months time. Uh, and so while countries like the Nordics have been quite well prepared for this, I'm really interested in seeing what are the countries that are going to sort of improve. It's kind of like teaching in a classroom, who are the students who are going to improve the most. And so it's unfair to say we have good leadership in Finland uh, when you have a small country that's well educated and a fairly homogenous uh, distribution of populations, et cetera, uh, and comparing that, say, to an Italy. Uh, but will Italy actually be the most innovative country and be able to respond much more effectively and our improvement may actually be much smaller. We may actually be more rigid uh, in our ability to adapt quickly to things. Um, and so this goes back to the question, how will we measure what's the sort of baseline for what is good uh, moving I forward? Think the question I'm, I'm, I'm going to rest back control. Sorry, Christian. <laughs> Just... Uh, because uh, I, I know you guys could take this talk, offline. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just going to go to um, I, I, I have Robert uh, Pollock's question uh, on on the chat because I think this this is this is one worth digging into for this this next half hour. Um, uh, uh, he, he says trust and empathy appear key to getting public behaviours on side. New Zealand seems to be doing well in there. UK it's getting more strained at the political level. Government modelling guidance from 2019. Uh, for, for 2019 uh, impacts uh, a novel infectious pandemic suggests mortality rates of 215 to 310k. To any of the panelists, to what extent should governments be honest with the public about future scenarios in terms of mortality and economic impacts of COVID? And, and, and maybe I'll just add a bit of an editorial on that. I, you know, we, we talk a lot about trust and candor and, and owning the fact we don't know the right answers. Um, you know, how, you know, there used to be a time when we, we just were expected to trust formal institutions and the fact that they had experts with these numbers. And now we're in an age where data is ubiquitous and we can access a lot of these epidemiological studies ourselves. And so actually not owning up to this and not sharing with this actually isn't taking the public into our confidence. So I'm just, I'm just wondering how trust and candor and sharing these sorts of things plays. Um, so hopefully I haven't completely destroyed Robert's question in doing so. Um, but his question was, yeah, how, to what extent should governments be honest with the public about scenarios in terms of mortality and impacts? So, um, you know, I, in, in my opening thoughts, I talked about three T's. Um, there would have been a fourth, uh, which would have been about transparency. And I think that, uh, you know, when we look at measures of governments around the world, the insights um, reports, for example, transparency is really important. Um, and through that, the ability for citizens to hold uh, those who are in power to account. Uh, so it is obviously important. Um, you know, as I said at the start, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to make any political points either. Uh, but I think that Governments across the world um, have made huge progress in terms of transparency and technology has enabled that in the way that you say, uh, Brenton. I mean, incidentally, blockchain, um, I looked into blockchain a few years ago uh, ahead of a speech I was giving in Sydney and blockchain, the next level of the internet is the internet uh, of, it goes beyond the internet of sort of things or the internet of data to being, um, transactions and trust and in that space you don't need if you take the scenario of the future of, of blockchain to its extreme you don't need institutions at all because you would have contracts between citizens and in some very small experimental way 
um, the distribution of power that we're seeing at the moment through these kinds of networked platforms is doing that also uh, with data and information. So I think it will um, bring more pressure on those who are in power to uphold standards and transparency in order to get that trust as well. So I think that that is important and uh, governments across the world will take different views in, in how, how they're going to handle that. Maybe just adding briefly to it that that I think you know ultimately we get the citizens we deserve, and uh, as I also wrote in the chat that I that you know showing vulnerability and openness and transparency uh, generates trust and and essentially we're seeing two different strategies working right now. One is sort of a hardcore centralized coercive strategy that we've seen in some countries, and the other one is strategies that of course have some rules and regulations put in place, but actually trust people to do the right thing. And, and actually, it turns out that both of them give uh, significant uh, behavioral outcomes. I would just probably like to live in a country that, that does the, the uh, vo voluntary ver version, which is depending on, 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 on generating you know, massive trust and empowerment of people rather than coercion. Yeah. I, I'm Apologies, this is laboring the point, but I think it, it is a really interesting situation at the moment in terms of that tension between the transparency creating trust versus transparency in a like extraordinarily complex um, balancing act of trying to, I mean, in, in, this, in Victoria, it's, it's exacerbated by the fact that the national government has quite a different approach to thinking about things than the state and but everyone wants to work as one and so the compromises and negotiations of how to you know people also want um clarity in crisis they want direction they want simplicity because they don't have bandwidth for understanding the complexity and so and i think that's that's not um that's not talking about the citizens that we don't want. It's, it's actually just an acknowledgement of that human factor is that we like our leaders to have a level of certainty. And I think when you start to bring people into the um, response process, particularly at these early stages where the pathways are so unknown and fluctuate on an almost daily basis, um, the, the confidence that you'd be able to achieve through the transparency, I'm not sure that it would deliver what we're looking for. I think it's a really interesting tension that, that needs to be tested and, and visible. Um, and, and I think the, you know, the Twitterverse is keeping that alive. Um, I'm going to move us on. Um, I, there's a question from Luis about um, uh, any advice on how to design and implement an open innovation collective intelligence process to co-create the new rules of the game for the post COVID era. Um, I, I think, you know, there's been a lot of commentary about, you know, um, whether it's the new normal or the fact we're not going to go back to what we had before. Um, what, what are the new rules and what's the process by which we start to design those? Um, so I'm not sure if anyone's got any emergent thoughts on what that might, what that might be or what you might yeah. like it to look like. I, I just wanted to share, I put a link up. It's unfortunately in Danish, but we're doing right now a survey of the public where we're asking for uh, scenario of 2021. So basically asking a number of questions about two different axes of, of the future uh, and, and getting sort of ca capturing some collective intelligence on on where does, uh, does the public see uh, our society heading. And, and the one axis is between, um, and we use the same axis for our, our big scenario conference in, in January. So, so we've already sort of, we, we're working very much on this already, but basically saying one axis is between a highly market driven society and a society driven by by uh, public outcomes and, and societal concerns. So that's one axis. The other one is between centralization on the one side and, and, and a distributed model on the other one. And right now, of course, we are in a situation right now where it's highly centralized and highly societally driven in terms of value creation. But the question is already by 2021 or 22, where will we then be? And we're also asking the public, what do they think will happen? And what would they like to see happening? So what's the what's the bandwidth between you know what they expect versus what they would prefer, and we're using this to sort of inform our scenario works. This is just one example of sort of harnessing some collective intelligence. 
Right, maybe come in on this one as well. So I think there's this natural tendency to think about uh, the future as being different from the present. And, I, and one of the things that I know in our team at the moment is we are simultaneously spinning three plates, if you like, um, the past, the present and the future. So it does feel a bit more like William Gibson's old phrase, you know, the future is here, it's just not widely distributed. Because in many respects, we are looking to other countries in different time frames as the counterfactual of what might happen if. Um, and so, for example, the UK has widely talked about being two weeks behind Italy. Uh, many countries will be however many weeks behind China. But of course, how each country responds will depend on, on the kind of rules and the scenarios that they want to um, create. In, in the policy lab, uh, if it's of interest, we've been using speculative design uh, to start to think about different scenarios and to start to bring those to life so that they are first of all imaginable. And again, I think this is a really important role that a design uh, and visualization can bring because it's about helping people think beyond the bounds of their own mental models and their own uh, perceptions of what the future might be. And then we can have conversations. Once you put out a, a scenario, uh, a detailed future, a speculative future, the, the whole point of them is that they are there in order for, to create debate. They're not there to be uh, idealized. Um, and so we can build in all sorts of interesting points within our speculations that allow us to then have those debates in a way that uh, teases out some of the nuance, which actually I think at the moment can get lost in the fact that there is so much going on uh, a lot of that complexity is, as, as was said, quite hard to handle. So we're, we're trying to do that to keep it really simple, but also to stretch the imagination. Um, we're actually, I'm hoping that in a couple of weeks, we're going to dig a bit deeper into uh, futures and speculative futures um, and have a, have a topic, to have an hour specifically on that. So um, uh, yeah, I, I think Helping, I think, you know, I, I, did a, I did a talk a couple of weeks ago on, on uh, leadership for these times. And, and one of the thoughts I had, and in fact, Jeff has just written about this for the guys at Demos about social imagination. And, and for me, I thought one of the big crises that we have is a crisis of imagination. Um, that, that actually people, sometimes people aren't able, A, to imagine what might be different, but B, to kind of actually make it concrete enough to see that that might be a, something that you can create. And that is, I think, a really interesting intersection between the design and the future space to, um, to both pull the future into the present, also to make it tangible and real so that people can actually treat it differently than rather than some abstract concept. It feels like it actually belongs right in the here and now. So hopefully we can, we can dig into that um, a little bit more. Um, Just as a quick addition, one of my team sent a picture of, I think it was The Economist had written a whole article about what the 2020s would be like but they'd written it, you know, a year ago. And of course, yeah. none of it bears out any truth um, in terms of what we're now experiencing. So it's just, it's just quite amusing to see uh, how some of these previous futures just haven't panned out. I mean, I guess, you know, and just linking it back to the topic around leadership, um, you know, uh, I guess, uh, you know, the leadership of ideas um, and how do you help people sort of step into that space so it's sort of part of a curation and a, and a convening role. It's part an encouragement and it's part also then a, a visualization. Um, hey, so I guess, um, Maybe yeah. just add into it uh, because uh, as I, again, we are really interested in this space. I'd love to, to listen into on, on the next session on speculative design. We're doing an exercise right now in the future of health where we basically, we call it the big bang. We just kind of explode healthcare and start all over, especially after the crisis, we're going to have to redesign the entire thing. Um, but I do think that speculative design and, and foresight work also tells us a lot about the present. So in a way, you can also, I think as a leader, use it as a reflective device to invite in conversations about the choices we're making now. So it's actually not very much about the future. It's really about reflecting on, on, on current practices. Absolutely. Um, there are lots of people interested in your approach, Andrea. So uh, do you have um, some links that we can share in the in the show notes, as they say in this, uh, this new podcast where we'll find ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, we've written quite a bit about uh, speculative design, specifically used in government. We've used it on the future of uh, courts in a digital age and open, um, you know, the sort of uh, open uh, 
processes of courts um, we've used it on the future of aging and, and lots of different topics and so um, in in the blog that is going live I think this week we, we also talk a little bit about our futures work so it will be in there and I'll send you a link cool um, I'm just pulling up another question I'm not sure who it's from so apologies so I'm getting it through um, the, the side channel back channel I'm also interested in how gender lens in leadership design and learning in these times and how these variables are showing up in new models of governance and decision making um, so what's the gender lens um, what is that um, telling us about this situation? I mean, you mentioned a little bit, uh, Christian, about the, your your prime minister. Yeah, I mean, there was a nice uh, article for, in the preparation for this call, right? Uh, that that female leaders have also had to fight a lot harder for the positions, and so it, it was really a. Um, you know, generally speaking, female top executives, both in government, certainly also in business, are simply just extremely more qualified than men because they've had to fight so hard and and be so focused, and it's a, it's a it's to break through the glass ceiling. So I think that's probably one argument, but I do think there may be other arguments, and and here you have to be really careful in sort of ascribing sort of general traits to gender, but. I think we're seeing in Denmark certainly that there's also becoming a bit of a joke, but that there's sort of there's this motherly, caring uh, approach from from the PM, which which I mean some 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 think are, is is irrelevant, others find it you know problematic. Uh, the other day there was a press conference where said, people said, well, she's beginning to speak to us like we're children. So it's it's a fine balance, but I think there is there is some some strength to sort of a more holistic way of thinking, perhaps that that we see from some of the the female uh, leaders um and 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 you know and where right now what we don't probably need is sort of brutal uh sort of uh testosterone driven uh, uh action it's it's a bit of a more um, holistic approach I, I won't say that male leaders couldn't in many ways do the same but i think there is something to it in, in my own um, senior leadership team we're two men and two women and i i find that actually really really uh, good as a balance. Uh, the same goes for our board. It's also 50-50, uh, or it's going to be 50-50 with our new board. If to me, that's actually a priority and it's something that I think we, we need to balance. We need to balance the, the genders, even though I, I think I, we have to be careful of ascribing very particular traits to it, even though I probably just did. So, uh, Sam, Andrea, I'm going to be really unfair, Andrew, and you can duck this question, but would Theresa May have done a better job? <laughs> <laughs> That's resolutely muted. Okay, I'm going to step in then. Um, um, look, I think I think it's interesting, and again, it's not really a gendered lens, but I think, well, I don't know. It's, I mean, caring caring responsibilities have been so much ascribed to the female responsibility side of things, and um, I think the fact that everyone's now in the home and everyone is needing to um, negotiate and and um, take the caring side of things seriously. It's it's um, and it's becoming very visible, therefore, in um, in senior leadership context. Because when you do a check in, everyone's got the kids and the homeschooling and the caring and responsibilities and the parents and the. So a lot of that again, it's like the more holistic, but it's the air. It's a, it's the private sphere that's more traditionally that part of the female male dichotomy that's starting to come into the public into the professional discourse in a way that I think is actually quite um, fundamentally shifts, shifts things, which is exciting. The home is an actor in the system now, in <laughs> people's homes, as you said at the start. Yeah. Um, look, uh, I'm, I'm conscious of time. Um, as always, there's like 20 different directions we could go and apologies if we didn't cover some of the questions that came up in the chat. Um, we will um, keep adding to them in the Google Doc. Um, but for now, um, I would like to just remind people that um, we're back again next week, uh, looking at experimentation and, and how we make the right kind of failures, or are we making the right failures? Um, it is, uh, do I need to share the screen again? Uh, I can do that, no, hang on. Um, here we are, this one. Um, so it will be at, um, Four o'clock, uh, eight, eight, eight a.m. Uh, UK time. Uh, sorry, eight a.m. Danish time. Four p.m. Sydney time. Melbourne time. Um, and uh, thank you uh, again, Christian, Andrea, and Sam, for all of your contributions. Um, 
please um, sign up for the newsletter, come back next week, um, uh, ask more questions on Twitter, um, look out for the festival. And um, if I haven't forgotten anything, Jesper? I did thank the speakers. Yes, good. No, good. All right. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you. Really interesting. Bye. Thanks a lot. And uh, James, you can stop the recording. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.